find the information that is really um, evidence-based to support sleep and why we do it and, and how we can make it better and how we can get better at it. So I'm happy to have this time to talk with you today. Um, this is just a very brief, very 3000 foot um, view of sleep and, and some of the different elements to it. Uh, I know that many of you are doing the Strive for Five. I am as well. And uh, sleep is one of my goals in there. So hopefully that will help you to do this. And then also, um, this is sort of a lead up to uh, the Sleep More Stress Less program, which I was very excited to be part of last year and equally excited to be part of again this year. So um, let's go ahead and get started here. So this is getting your, be your best night's sleep. Um, and let's see if we could get it to advance. There we are. Um, so I'm an instructor, I'm a teacher, so I have to give you an outline. So we're going to talk a little bit about what normal sleep is. What are some of the requirements for sleep? Probably one of the most common questions that I get when I talk to people about sleep is, how much sleep do I really have to get? So we're going to talk a little bit about what some of the recommendations are for, um, for how much sleep you really have to get to be your best self. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of sleep disruptors. And I like to think of it from this perspective of, of both personal or internal kinds of disruptors, things that might be disrupting your sleep, as well as environmental. Um, some of those things are going to be within your control, and some of them you just sort of need to acknowledge uh, that they may be influencing your sleep and you, you sort of work around them or try to do your best to modify them as you can. And then most importantly, sleep promoters. So what are some good sleep habits? Um, what is stimulus control? Is a particular um, evidence-based approach, uh, worry scheduling, and then some relaxation and deep breathing um, kinds of things that we're gonna talk about. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and move forward. So first off, what is normal sleep? So what is sleep and how does it work or how it works? Um, we're really looking at here, one of the things that I want you to take away from this slide is really this piece down here at the bottom, that your nightly sleep pattern is really four to five cycles of 90 to 120 minutes at a time. So before I started becoming a sleep scientist, I really thought that, oh, well, you go to bed at a particular time and you get up at a particular time and that's your sleep. And it's it's just sort of this huge packet of time or narrower packet of time, depending on how much you have there. But we actually cycle in and out of sleep and depth of sleep. So it's really your sleep in that period of time is constructed of smaller packets of sleep. And we actually look at it from a perspective of sleep architecture is what we call it. So how is it built? How is your sleep built? How much of what kind of sleep do you have? How much of um, different elements do you have of your sleep? And then that really sort of comes back around, just like if you were building a building or a bridge, you would want to know what kind of architecture was in place, what kind of structural pieces were put together to be able to make this a most functional um, aspect as as you can have. And so in this case, we're really looking at sleep and a combination of those different packets. So you move from wake to REM sleep. Your REM sleep is actually pretty close to wake. Um, so this particular model here or slide is really showing you about the depth of your sleep. So you go from wake, which is not asleep at all, into very deep sleep, which is non-REM sleep. And that's usually your stage three to four non-REM sleep. And so that's real deep sleep. Then you'll rise back up about 90 to 120 minutes later, you'll rise back up into a REM stage, which is very close to sleep as far as depth, uh, very close to wake, which is um, in stages of depth. Then you go back down into another deep sleep and you see that you'll get um, some some deeper sleep again in that second cycle. And then as you move through your cycles throughout the night, they actually spend more, more and more time in light sleep stages and less and less time in deep sleep stages. So this is just another diagram again to sort of explain this as well. So your first cycle, second cycle, third, fourth, fifth cycle. So again, those are about 90 to 120 minutes in, in, in length. 
And this one takes you through the different stages of sleep. So from wake to REM being close to wake, stage one, two, non-REM sleep, stage three, four, non-REM sleep or slow wave sleep. I like this slide because it really helps you also see what is the purpose or what is the functionality of these different kinds of sleep. And this is science that has been going on for a long time, but we're still learning new things every single day about the different functions of sleep and what it does for you. So as you move through these different stages, this particular slide shows you where where do different kinds of things happen in your sleep? What is the focus or what is the function of that type of sleep? So it appears that that slow wave sleep, that deep non-REM sleep that you get in approximately in the first half of your night is really focused on your physiological recovery. So your cellular recovery, helping your heart function as best as it can, helping your muscles function as best as it can. And then in the second half of the night or the second part of the play that you're doing here is really focused on your psychological recovery or your mental health recovery. And a lot of that you notice is spent in that lighter stage sleep or that REM sleep. So REM sleep really helps us to be able to sort of process the psychological things that are going on. Now, an interesting piece that you might see here and sort of supports this theory and supports these findings is that if you are ill, if you have a physiological um, crisis that you're going through, so you have an illness that your body is fighting, you may actually spend more of your time in that deep sleep because your body's trying to recover. Your body's trying to do that physiological recovery. Conversely though, if you are having a psychological trauma or a psychological challenge, um, you're really stressed, you may find that you spend more or almost all of your night in that light stage sleep. And when you wake up, when you finally get out of bed after that really, um, that eight hours of in that light sleep, you feel physiologically exhausted a lot of times. You feel like all you did is toss and turn all night long and you really didn't sleep at all. And that's because you didn't get that deep physiological slow wave sleep, right? So we're, again, this science is evolving day by day. We're learning new things, but I like this because it sort of helps us to understand that if I cut myself off after four hours of sleep, those folks that say I can get by on four hours of sleep, I'm perfectly fine. You might be physiologically, but your mental health, your ability to interact with others in such a way that you're not anxious, you're not quick to react or quick to anger, could be impaired because you're not getting that second half of the sleep that you need, that function there. So again, what controls these different processes of sleep? How do we, how does our body know what kind of sleep that we need? It's really controlled by two different processes here. So this is, and these are, these are working all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for the 80 plus years that we're alive, hopefully is that um, these are controlled by two different processes. So one is a homeostatic process. So that means that it's really trying to balance um, the sleep need that you have based on, or it's calculating it based on how well you slept the night before. So if you had a really good night's sleep, then your process S or your sleep drive is going to be low because it's going to say, well, you filled up the tank with this 24 hours or in this past 24 hours was really good deep sleep. And so the need is not as much as if you had a bad night's sleep. So that process S or that sleep drive is going to be calculated, recalculated essentially every day based on how well you slept the night before and how much activity you're doing during the day. So it's really sort of a 24 hour cycle. Um, on top of that, or in concordance with that, is your process C or your circadian rhythm. Your circadian rhythm really doesn't care how well you slept the night before because it's going to be driven by your hormones, primarily by the hormone melatonin. 
So melatonin is our sleepy hormone. It is one that is released in the center of your brain, and it is triggered by the amount of light exposure that you have, specifically blue light or white light, bright, say, sunshine, right? So with that, the melatonin cuts off. So the sleepy hormone stops being produced in your brain when that light goes through your eyes to the center of your brain uh, and says, cut it off. I'm supposed to be awake because typically we would expect if we're exposed to light, that's the time to wake up. So we're going to cut off our melatonin, wake up and be more alert. You can see from this cycle that um, as that red line goes down, that process C goes down, we're going to be more sleepy, right? And then as it goes up, we're less sleepy, we're more alert. And we go through these cycles every day. There are some additional rhythms in there um, that we can see some dips around the midpoint of the day um, as well. And, and that just gets this slide way to um, way too busy for this point. So for this, the takeaway, you have two main processes that are telling your body whether it needs to be more alert or more awake or more sleepy and more ready to go to bed. And those are both hormonal as well as what's happened in the last 24 hours or your process S or your homeostatic drive. So then Again, the big question, right? How much sleep do I actually need? Do I really have to get six hours? Do I really have to get eight hours? And this is, like I said, it's one of the most common questions I get, but it's also sort of one of the most, I guess, irritating questions that I receive because nobody else would ever come to me and say, you know, do I really have to breathe 12 to 14 times per minute or could I cut that down to six and still be okay? And I would basically say, well, no, you really sort of need to oxygenate. So you need to breathe more frequently than that. But breathing 50 times a minute is not good either. You're going to hyperventilate, not, not be able to. Do. So sleep is a natural process that your body's going to tell you how much you need to be able to function your best during the day. So rather than thinking, thinking of sleep as something that is robbing you from the opportunity to be awake and do all those wonderful things, think of sleep as something that is giving you the energy to do what you really want to do during the day and to be your best self during that time. So it's giving you something rather than robbing you from something. I'm all about cognitive reframing. So how much sleep do you actually need? So for a long time, what we looked at as sleep scientists is we conducted a whole bunch of studies that said, okay, if I'm looking at someone's functionality, if I'm looking at their cognitive functioning and their memory, if I'm looking at their physiological functioning and how much weight they can lift or their muscle recovery or their wound healing, a number of different studies, what's the cutoff point as to when their functionality drops. Okay. So what, how much sleep does somebody need before their function drops off? And that was pretty, that's pretty much been set for a long time to be at about a minimum of six hours per 24 hour period of time. Okay. There are some people that will say are genetically gifted that can have less than six hours per 24 hour period of time and not suffer the negative consequences that most of the rest of us see. I've yet to meet one of those people um, in all of my years of doing this, and it actually works out to be only about two to 3% of the population. Does that mean that people don't sleep five hours or less than six hours and move throughout their day? Yes, they do, but that doesn't mean that they're optimally functioning. So this particular slide is really looking at recommendations for optimal functioning, getting the most out of your day. So if you're a newborn, if you have a newborn, optimal functioning is most likely gonna fall between that 14 to 17 hours per 24 hour period of time that they need to be sleeping. Obviously they're not doing an, a 14 to 17 hour all in one time, they can't physiologically su sustain that. They need to eat more frequently than that. 
But you may also have some kiddos that do pretty good on 11 to 13 hours or that really are your long sleepers and they need 18 to 19 hours. Those are normal ranges, right? Then as you move through the year, so there's recommendations for infants, toddlers, preschoolers, school age, teenagers, and in all of these categories, you see that it's sort of decreasing in the amount of time. And what I want you to recognize here is just like when you're moving from a newborn to a teenager and you're talking about them being able to walk, their skill at walking, they're developing, their brain is developing a skill in being able to sleep more efficiently, to build that architecture, to provide the body with what it needs to be able to optimally function. They also need more sleep. So when they're younger, they're not as good at sleeping, just like they're not as good at walking, right? As they are when they're teenagers, but they're also rapidly developing. You know, you, you, if you're a grandparent like I am, and it seems like you blink and they move from just being able to sit up to walking, right? So they're rapidly developing in just a very short period of time. So they need that sleep to be able to rapidly develop and to optimally function and to learn how to sleep better. Then you move into young adults and adults and older adults. Now look at that darker blue line there, seven to nine recommended hours, seven to nine recommended hours, seven to eight recommended hours, right? There's not as much of a change in the required or the recommended sleep between an 18 year old and an 80 year old. Now they may not be getting as much sleep, but that doesn't mean that they don't need that sleep to be able to optimally function. And an entire different talk would be about how do you control your sleep? How do you be able to optimize your sleep when you're in those older age periods? Um, and I'll be happy to talk with you all about that. But that, again, that's an entirely different talk um, because there's a lot of information about how your sleep changes as you get older and how do you maximize um, what you can get um, in that time frame. Okay, so why am I even concerned about how much sleep you get and the recommended times that you need and the amount of sleep that you need? Sleep debt is something that most of the population around the world is suffering with. And uh, COVID actually helped us be able to sleep a little bit better in some cases because we were a little bit more in control of our scheduling if we were working from home um, and being able to get up a little bit later and go to bed a little bit earlier or shift to our natural rhythm. But most of us are carrying around some sleep debt. A little bit of sleep debt, like a little bit of financial debt can actually give you a boost. You see this first guy here is smiling. He's happy, right? Because he's lifting just a little bit of sleep debt. Physiologically, your body goes, okay, wait a minute. They've got a little bit of sleep debt. So we need to ramp things up a little bit here to be able to make them um, overcome or overcompensate for that little bit of a deficit because of the sleep debt. So you actually function a little bit better on a small amount of sleep debt. However, as you carry that sleep debt and it builds up and it gets bigger and bigger, just like financial debt, if you don't pay it off, it's gonna crush you in a short period of time. Now, people oftentimes will ask me, well, how much sleep debt is okay, enough debt to carry? Well, if you're a young person, you can actually tolerate a larger sleep debt than if you're an older person. When I was in 18 or 20 years old, if I pulled an all-nighter, I could recover sleeping 12 hours the next day and I'd be fine. However, if I'm at my ripe old age here, if I tried to pull an all-nighter, it might take me a week to recover from that. So it all depends on you personally and what your tolerance is, just like financial debt. Um, if you have a steady reserve, then you can handle or tolerate a larger debt than if you do not. And in this case, it's a physiological reserve of being younger and being able to handle things rather than older. So sleep disruptors. I really like to look at it from this perspective because 
when we identify in our own world what is disrupting our sleep, then we have targets to be able to actionally ac take actions against, right? So actionable things that we can do to remove those disruptors or to remove their influence on our ability to sleep well. So from here, I want you to think about it as a sleep-wake cycle. So it's not just sleep in and of itself, but when we look at sleep, we measure sleep and we evaluate sleep as it falls between two wake time periods, because it's really about what you do during the day and how that leads into your sleep at night. And then how well do you function the next day based on that quality of sleep that you've had that night? So it's really about that whole cycle and what we can do at these various points in order to maximize the quality of what you get in that sleep at night. So sleep disruptors, here we go. We've taken our electronic equipment to bed and we'll talk about why that's not a good thing. So I want you to think about again, so sleep disruptors from your phys physical sleep disruption. So you, we can have physical ailments or physical conditions that can disrupt our sleep. If we have, so it's not only the illness, also it might be the treatments that we're receiving, the medications that we're receiving. For example, if you have a respiratory condition, if you have asthma and you take steroids, steroids physiologically wake the body up. They are really helpful to help the asthmatic be able to breathe, and that's critically important. But if you take those steroids too close to bedtime, it can actually prevent you from being able to fall asleep and stay asleep deeply. So each one of these physical illnesses or physical symptoms that you may have and their treatments, if you have any of these comorbidities, talk to your physicians, talk to your nurse practitioners and say, okay, are these medications you get, you're giving me, do they have, might they have an effect on my sleep? And if they do, could I take them at a different time? If they're medications that might make you feel a little bit sleepy, maybe it's good if you can take them right before bed versus if they're medications like those steroids I mentioned that might make you more awake, could I take them first thing in the morning to help me be able to do that? if it's required um, that, or if it's not required that you have to take it at a particular time. So this is certainly not something that you can just try on your own. You need to have the support of your medical professionals to help you choose when can you take them so that it has the minimal effect on the quality of sleep that you get. Because also each of these conditions can be made worse by poor sleep quality. Okay. And they can be made better by good sleep quality. So there's some reason for why you want to investigate when can you take these medications so that it has the less of least effect on your overall sleep quality. Over to the other side of the slide, mental and emotional. Again, each of these conditions and their accompanying treatments can be negative, can negatively affect your ability to sleep well. And they can also negatively affect the illnesses themselves, can be made worse by poor sleep, and they can actually be made better by good sleep. So again, go back and investigate that. And then of course, we can't forget the everyday stressors that we're facing all the time and thinking about, and that's where we get into that sleep more, stress less program is it really helps you to be able to investigate how is your anxiety, how is your stress negatively impacting your sleep, and then how does a bad night's sleep actually set you up to be more stressed the next day? Um, so again, a, an entire different talk that we could do, but it's just in this case, I want you to just sort of be aware that some of these different factors may be influencing your overall sleep quality. So those are sort of the internal things that are going on. External things that are sleep disruptors might be your lifestyle. So some of the different timing of things that you're having to do. We all have that circadian rhythm. There's early birds, there's night owls, there's people that seem to be able to adjust either way. But if your timing, if your job or your social expectations are in conflict with your internal timing, 
you're going to feel what we call social jet lag. So just like flying from here to another country that's another day later, you're going to feel that draggy feeling. You're going to feel out of alignment with the rest of the world. So thinking about when and if you can adjust your schedule to allow you to be able to do the critical activities during the time that you're most naturally awake and or trying to shift your circadian rhythm, which is possible to do. Um, so thinking about that alignment between what is your body telling you you need to do when you need to do it, and then how are you aligning your social obligations, your work obligations with those natural physiological patterns that you have. Exercise is on here because exercise is great for your sleep, um, but you have to do it at the right time of the day because exercise will heat up your internal core. That's what it's supposed to do, burn more calories, right? Heat up your internal core. But in order to get a good deep sleep, you have to let that internal core cool down, which is another trigger to help you be able to turn on your melatonin and get that deep sleep. So aerobic exercise, strong exercise that is getting your heart rate up and getting you moving, right? Place that in the first half of your day. It reduces stress. It helps you oxygenate. It helps you release those serotonin and it will help you sleep better at night. But if you put it too close to when you want to go to bed, it's actually working against you being able to fall asleep and sleep well. So it's thinking about the timing of when you do those things. Uh, your, the chemicals that you choose to put into your body, tobacco, caffeine, alcohol, all socially acceptable chemicals. However, um, you have to think about what are they doing to potentially affect the quality of sleep that you have. Now, full disclosure, I'm a nurse, so I'm going to tell you limit or wipe out these chemicals if you can, because they're going to uh, not only affect your sleep, but also affect the functioning of your body as well across the board. Um, tobacco, what we're really looking at there is we're looking at the nicotine. Um, so it doesn't really matter. You don't have to be smoking it. You can be getting that nicotine um, from any other sources as well. And that's going to, that nicotine is a stimulant and it's going to um, reduce your ability to be able to fall asleep and stay asleep deeply. Um, caffeine. Uh, some people say I'm not affected by caffeine. I say, okay, let's get you off of it for about a week and then see how deeply you sleep when you don't have that influence there because caffeine is going to uh, keep you in those lighter stages of sleep. Even if it doesn't prevent you from falling asleep altogether, it's going to keep you in those lighter stages of sleep. And that's again, robbing you from that physiological recovery. Um, alcohol is interesting because alcohol actually has sedative effects at the, right at the beginning and it can reduce your stress. And so it can help you to fall asleep. But if you don't drink enough water and you don't have enough time between when you had that alcohol and when you go to bed, it can actually um, be perceived in your body as something that needs to be eliminated. And so it's going to, uh, if you don't have enough water, it's going to dehydrate you. And that's one of the reasons you're going to wake up in the morning with a headache, but it's also um, going to wake you up to make you have to go pee, right? Uh, your environment. So what is your sleep environment? What should it look like? So noise, you should have um, quiet, not necessarily silent because some people it's actually sort of creepy for them to sleep in a silent room. It makes them hear everything that's not even there. So something that is, um, that is quiet, um, white noise is very common here. So this might be a flat, it might be a fan or something like that that's playing in the background. What you do not want to have there is like the TV playing in the background because what that's going to do is not only with the light from the TV, but it's also going to be the noise that's fluctuating and your brain is going to be saying, okay, should I be listening to that or can I actually be sleeping? And so it becomes a mixed signal there um, in your brain as to whether it wants to be awake or not. 
Um, light exposure, this is something that's really important that you think about getting that bright light in the first half of your day, because remember that's gonna cut off your melatonin. So allow you to be more alert and awake. But then in the second half of your day, you want to have light exposure um, it, that will allow that melatonin to come on. So in the second half of your night or the second half of your day, when you're getting ready to go to bed in the say one hour to three hours before bed, think about your mood lighting in your room. Is it thinking more sunset or is it more sunrise? So if it's sunset, that's going to allow your melatonin to come on. It's going to allow you to be able to um, get that full uh, effect of that melatonin to be able to fall asleep and stay asleep deeply. The temperature in your room, again, we wanted to be able to have your core body temperature drop down that will allow your melatonin to again come on and have that deep sleep that you need. So the temperature, the ideal temperature in the room is cool, but not cold. So you don't want to be shivering, but you want to have it cool enough that you're also not sweating and you're able to allow that core body temperature to drop down and stay down. The recommendations is 68 um, degrees. Uh, is the optimal sleeping temperature. I think that was probably designed by somebody up north because um, living in 20, 20 years in Texas before I came here and then living here in Alabama for the last couple of years, it's really hard to get down to 68 degrees and I think I would be shivering if I got there. So for me personally, it's um, usually around 75 to 77 degrees that I feel most comfortable and can stay sleeping um, and sleeping well. And, and I just put mixed signals on here because you really want to be thinking about your environment as one that is conducive to sleep. So you're not sitting there um, doing your bills in bed. You're not reading in bed. You're, you're not doing things that are not conducive to sleep. I tell people sleep, is, your bed is for sleep and sex only. And if you're doing anything else there, then you're probably not doing those first two things very well. Um, I borrowed that from, uh, from Dr. Iyer, the second half of that. So uh, I, really, uh, I really like that piece and that sort of remembering. So take those other activities somewhere else. So a fundamental problem, you cannot force yourself to sleep. Okay, so sleep is something that I call the most actively passive thing that you will do all day long, every single day of your life. So you can manipulate your environment. You can think about reducing your stress level, but when it comes down to it, you have to allow sleep to happen. You have to let it happen. You cannot make it happen. The minute that you start stressing about it, the minute you start trying to control the situation or force it to happen, your alertness hormones are going to kick in and it completely removes the opportunity for you to fall asleep. So it's more important for you to focus on these different sleep disruptors, which ones you might have, which ones you can move around, which ones you can modify so that you create an environment internally and externally that's more conducive to allowing yourself to fall asleep and stay asleep deeply. So remember I said sleep-wake cycle. So it's all your sleep-wake cycle and knowing that cycle, one of the things I want you to think about here is what do you do the last 30 minutes before bed? This is what a lot of our lives look like the last 30 minutes before bed, okay? We're running, 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 running. And then we get, we check our watch or we see something on the clock or on our phone. And it's like, oh my goodness, I have to be up in six hours. I go to bed and it's like, sleep, 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 right? You cannot force it to happen. So you have to think about what am I doing in that last 30 to 60 minutes before bed? And am I setting myself up? Am I preparing myself to be able to fall asleep and stay asleep? Okay. You will fall asleep if you're exhausted enough, but then you'll wake up about two to three hours later, wide eyed and not be able to get back to sleep. 
Okay. That's a defense mechanism. You were so exhausted that your body was afraid that if a tiger came along, you wouldn't be able to outrun it. So it's going to let you sleep for about 30 minutes to maybe three hours. And then you're going to be wide awake because you actually went to bed thinking there was a tiger that was chasing you, right? With that stress. So you have to be able to set up your environment, both your physical environment around you, as well as your internal environment to convince your brain and your body that it's okay, that it's safe, that you can fall asleep. This is a good time. And this is the time to allow yourself to do this. So cool, comfortable environment. I mentioned this before, reducing that noise and that light keeping your room comfortable for sleeping for you, avoiding eating, watching TV, studying, doing bills, any of those mixed signals, things in bed. Put your clock out of sight if it's a trigger for you that you wake up and you look at it and it's like, oh my God, I've only been asleep for 20 minutes. Or, oh my God, I've only been asleep for two hours. Or, oh my God, I've got to be up in two hours. And then your brain starts racing. Okay, Because the minute that you say, oh my God, X, adrenaline, you're awake, right? And it's gonna take you 30 to 90 minutes to calm back down, to fall back to sleep, okay? We can wake up in an instant, but it takes our body a while to be comfortable and feel like it's safe to be able to fall back asleep, right? So it's best to put that clock out of sight or retrain your brain to say, oh, yay, I've got another two hours before I have to get up. Or, yeah, I woke up 20 minutes before my clock went off. 20 minutes, that's a power nap. I can sleep for another 20 minutes. And you fall back asleep. Maybe it's a light sleep, but that's okay. It's not the, oh my God, adrenaline kickoff. Okay? And again, you can't work at going to sleep. It's not a job to do. Get into a routine. Your body loves a routine. It loves to eat at the same time. It loves to exercise at the same time. It loves to be able to sleep at the same time. It loves to be able to wake up at the same time, right? If it can anticipate when you're going to give it what it needs, it doesn't have to stress about it. It doesn't have to worry about it. So even if you're not in the front of your brain worrying about it, your body's worrying about these things. When is she going to feed me again? When am I going to sleep again? Think about your children, right? They cry when they want, when are you going to feed me again? Right? They want to stay on a routine, right? So getting into that routine, these are some of the different kinds of things that you might choose to do those two to three hours before bed. Now I know I started at 30 minutes and then I went to 60 minutes and now I'm saying two to three hours. It's really something that you can think about all day long. How am I going to, and think about, creatively think about, not worry about how am I going to get a good night's sleep tonight? What am I going to do? How am I going to enhance my ability to get really good quality sleep tonight? What are all the things that I can do to help me get a great night's sleep tonight? In fact, when I wake up after a bad night's sleep, which I still do have bad night's sleeps, what I do is I say to myself, I'm primed to sleep well tonight. So I'm automatically reframing, how am I gonna think about this? Because I know that I can do, I know all the things that I need to do during the day to be able to get a good night's sleep that night. And I'm gonna have that process S drive that's just gonna be the bonus that's gonna help me fall asleep and stay asleep well that night. Avoiding stimulants. So these are some of the different things. Um, I put some time limits on here as to when you should do these things. Again, it's really your individual body. Um, some people like the second bullet point, avoiding caffeine six hours before bedtime. For me, I'm really hypersensitive to it. So I love my coffee in the morning. It gets me going. But by the time I'm around 12 noon, so just before we started here, if I start drinking any coffee after that, then I know that it's going to affect my ability to sleep well tonight because that's just how long I'm sensitive to it. So know your own body and listen to your own body and what it is that works well for you. So some relaxation, um, whatever it is, I like this down here, 
any healthy activity, healthy, healthy activity that helps you to escape for a while and replenish your energy will be helpful. So any of these activities that are healthy, that will help you to be able to remove your stress as you move throughout the day. Don't think that you can walk through your day all day long, gathering up stress into your bushel of stress here, right? And then you're going to just magically by doing a few deep breaths before you go to bed, erase all of that stress that you carry during the day. So think about strategically, put it on your, on your Fitbit to give you a reminder, take a few deep breaths. That's one of the things that I'm doing on my Strive for Five is that little bit of relaxation, that little bit of meditation, that breathing that helps me as I move throughout the day um, to be able to remove that stress and feel a little bit better. And it sets me up for a good night's sleep that night. So I like all these summary slides because I'm always thinking, okay, I need to, have, what, what was that again? I missed that one. So summaries again, exercise in the first half of your day because that helps you to be able to get that serotonin, get that positive benefit, but it doesn't heat up your core too close to bed. Um, watch your caffeine, watch your light sources, get that bright light in the morning. When you wake up, flip up those lights. It cuts your melatonin off. It wakes you up a little bit faster and it helps you to be able to set your circadian rhythm to say, okay, I'm supposed to be awake at this time. This is a good time to get charged and get moving. Um, cool, quiet, quiet and dark uh, environment. Establish your bedtime routine and then leave the stress outside of the bedroom. I love this picture because our pets, when they're tired, they just sleep wherever, whenever, however, no stress, they just sleep. We can learn a lot of lessons from them. So I've mentioned it a couple of bit times, um, the Sleep More Stress Less program, which begins in October. It's an awesome program if you haven't participated in it before. Even if you have participated in it, we're happy to have you back again. Um, you can always learn new things. I was so excited when I came here a couple of years ago that they had this program and I'm happy to be part of it again this time. And let's see, so thank you for listening. This is my email address that you can reach me at if you have some questions you do not want to ask online. Um, but otherwise, uh, I am happy to take questions. So you can <clears throat> just, we're, they're coming through on the chat. So if you have questions, I'm just gonna <clears throat> take a little sip of water here. You can go ahead and type it into the chat and I'll be happy to try to answer them for you. I'm gonna stop sharing this screen. Let's see, there's one. Uh, there was one question here on, could we get a copy of the presentation? Just to remind ourselves, Carolyn, this I can definitely up. forward that to everybody. Okay. Like, as long as you're good. Okay. Good, good, good. Janet, you are welcome. Does hot water, does he, does hot water, I'm gonna open this up so I don't lose this here. Um, okay, so does hot water before bed affect sleep? So um, I'm wondering if, do you mean that taking a hot bath. So a hot bath actually can help you to be able to sleep better because it causes a relaxation, but then also it, it actually, it seems sort of interesting, but it, it drops your core body temperature because the way that we as humans are most effectively cooled is through evaporative cooling. So when we take a hot bath, when you get out, you notice your skin is all nice and bright red. That's because the blood is, is moved to the surface of your skin. And then with the cool temperature, especially um, if you stand in front of a fan when you're wet, that'll drop your core body temperature down and cool you off. So it will help you to be able to sleep better. Um, if the, I didn't quite get to your, to your, um, question or answer your question, then you can ask me again in another way. And I will try, uh, melatonin is melatonin, uh, recommended to take if you've had a hard time falling asleep. So this is another very common question that I get. And melatonin is your natural sleepy hormone. 
So typically my recommendation to people is that not to take a hormone, take a supplement if you don't need it. So there are ways that you can enhance your own melatonin release. And in fact, if you take exogenous or supplemental melatonin when you don't really need it, then your body will say, why do I need to keep taking, making all of this melatonin if I don't really need this much melatonin? So um, it's something that you want to take cautiously, but we do know that it is recommended in some cases with children, because again, they're still learning how to sleep well. And so um, we can give them small dosages in children who are not getting, um, reproducing enough melatonin. And then we also see as we age that melatonin tends to drop off. So it, oftentimes we'll give it to people as they get a little bit older. So it's not something that I say, absolutely do not take any melatonin. It's more about, well, do you really need it? And then you also have to think about, am I really getting the melatonin that I think I'm getting? Because as a supplement, it's not regulated the way say insulin or even aspirin is. So we need to think about, am I really getting what I'm getting there? And the gummies, we're combining the melatonin and the sugar. And so they're sort of counteracting each other. So that's my long, short story about melatonin. Um, yeah, it is, um, I don't mean to interrupt you, but we've got several questions also in the question and answer. Oh, okay. Okay. We were, we're getting them all over the place. Yeah. Um, let me just see. Rule about eating too close to bedtime. You really, um, there's not so much about that. You, you want to have smaller meals because you don't want to have your gut working too hard while you're sleeping, but you also don't want to go to bed sleepy or go to bed hungry because that'll keep you awake. Uh, tips for having to change sleep positions during pregnancy, got the special pillow, um, but miss sleeping on your back. Yeah, well, we actually know that if you sleep on your side, especially your left side, that the blood flow is better to your baby. So that's one of the reasons why we don't really like you sleeping on your back, but you can get back there after you deliver this wonderful baby. Um, let's see, thank you. Having a 13 year old, having difficulty falling asleep, uh, good wants to sleep, but difficulty falling asleep, no screen time, 45 minutes. So 13 years old, they're getting to that point where they're doing a phase shift. So they're actually really, really sensitive to light between about the ages of 13 and 21. Um, so you want to not only limit the screen time, but absolutely no screen time and as dark as possible, but then also be recognizing that their natural body is just shifting to be sleeping at that later time and waking at that later time. So reducing the amount of light that they get right before going to bed, and then also being able to help them um, get brighter light in the morning uh, and will, could potentially be helpful there. Uh, let's see, sometimes you use relaxing uh, music to sleep and is it a good option? So music is great. It sort of depends on whether it is waking you up or not. A lot of times what I will do with music is to set it on a timer so that it shuts off at about 45 minutes into the sleep because you're going to be in a deep sleep there and you're not going to hear it cut off. So it's less likely to wake you up than if you set it at maybe 10 minutes or so. Okay, I'm going to jump over to the question and answer ones here. Um, what about sleeping while traveling in different time zones, minimize jet lag. So really with sleeping in different time zones, um, and minimizing that jet lag, you can, in this case, this is one of the recommendations for using melatonin to sort of shift your circadian rhythm to that new time zone. However, if you're going to be there less than a, less than a week, you may, and if your schedule is not absolutely firm that you have to be awake during their wake time. You may want to try to stay closer to your natural time that you're, you're here. Um, but it's, it's sort of one of those things that if you have the opportunity, you can start trying to shift your phase, um, your circadian rhythm to that new time zone, but it becomes 
uh, it becomes sort of futile if you're not there for a long enough period of time. You can also look at your light sources because your melatonin is going to kick on and cut off, you know, based on those light sources. So using to work into uh, getting those light sources to wake you up and help you be able to sleep better. Other kinds of what we call zydergers or timekeepers in our body are to have your meals at the particular time that is aligned with the place that you're at. So if you're eating dinner at dinner time there, not dinner time here and so forth, that can help you to sort of overcome some of that jet lag. Um, let's see, so Teresa here has when calculating your sleep each night, uh, uh, do you go by how long you thought you were sleeping or by what your Fitbit says. <laughs> That's really interesting. So um, I, I have a love-hate relationship with my Fitbit in that I'm, my love relationship is that it's increasing people's knowledge about sleep uh, and their awareness that sleep might be important, but it's not always the best measure. Um, so I look more about, I calculate on how well I feel. Uh, so I say I have a good night's sleep or a bad night's sleep or not as good night's sleep based on how well I feel. So how much energy do I have to do what I need to do during the day? And then that's, that's my overall quality of sleep. Otherwise, I look at it from just giving myself the amount of time that I need to be able to sleep. So an opportunity to get that amount of time. So I'm never going to get my seven and a half, eight hours of sleep that I know I need physiologically if I don't even give myself more than a six hour window to be able to sleep. So I start getting ready for bed around 9.15. Um, I know I have my set wake up time. I actually, my clock goes off at 5.58 every morning. So I wake up at 5.58 every morning, but I'm heading for bed. I'm getting ready for bed around 9.15 most nights. So um, that gives me that window of time to get ready for bed, to have my nightly routine, to fall asleep by around 10, 10, 15, and still have my eight hour window that I can, I can sleep and get what I need. Um, why do we get sleepy in the afternoon and what can we do about it? You get sleepy in the afternoon because that's your natural circadian dip there. That's why um, some hypotheses have been that uh, when we were in an agrarian society, when we were all farmers, we would need to get up before the sun. We'd need to have some rest period when it's really, really hot in the middle of the day. And then we'd be able to work some more in the evening. And so we have that natural circadian rhythm. We haven't changed a whole lot since then. The best thing that you can do during that time is to be able to um, get up and move around, okay? Um, not having your coffee during that time because having that coffee during that time is going to potentially affect your ability to sleep during the night. But if you get up and move around, then that's going to wake you up a little bit more. Um, unless, of course, you have the opportunity to take a nap, then you can just take a nap during that time. And then I hear there's a great red couch over in wellness and work life that they may, they may rent out for naps, I think, maybe. Um, let's see, how accurate are the apps that track your sleep? And can an Apple Watch or Fitbit really know how long you stay in REM or deep sleep? So all of these different um, factors are all of these different pieces of equipment. They're getting better. They're a lot better than they were even a couple of years ago, and they're getting better and better at being able to sense that. Essentially, what they do is they track your movement. So they're not really reading your um, EEG, which is telling your brainwaves saying whether you're in REM sleep or whether you're in stage one non-REM or stage four non-REM sleep. It's really about um, looking at how much movement do you have? So it's called, it's, it's a technology is called actigraphy. So it measures how much you move. And when you're in those deeper stages of sleep, you move less, you're paralyzed. And especially when you're in REM sleep, you're paralyzed. And that's a protective factor. You don't want to be living out those dreams that you're having so vividly, right? So our body is paralyzed. We have less movement. It calculates the less movement that you have, the period of time that you have less movement, and then it recalculates that into 
different stages of sleep. So some of them are better than worse, um, but it's not so much that you need to get into those details, digging into those details. They're not generally as helpful as just being able to ask your question, did I sleep well last night? And do I feel like I have enough energy to do what I need to do during the day? Or do I need to modify myself and, and my actions in some kind of way to, to do better? Um, is there a rule about eating a meal too close to the bedtime? Um, I think I sort of answered that one on another factor, another one, but essentially there's no, no necessary rule about when you need to eat before bed. It's more about the size of the meal and the type of the meal. You don't want to eat something that's so large that it's going to cause you have to, um, to digest that because digestion is one of those uh, body systems that's supposed to be quiet during sleep, not something that's really hyperactive. So a small snack so that you're not hungry, that your blood sugar doesn't drop and wake you up and need to eat something, but generally have your larger meals earlier in the day rather than right before bed. And let's see if I've got any more in here. Thank That's you. A lot. Those are all great questions. I need to take your nap. Okay. I like that, Diana. Enjoy your nap. All right. Well, those were great questions. Thank you so much. That was that was fast. You got through all of those. Perfect amount of time. Um, all right. Well, so if anybody would like the presentation, just email uh, wellness at ua.edu. I know I have that. Um, other participant, I'll get that out to you. But um, anyone else, just let us know. We'll, we'll get that to you. And um, remember, if you're interested in more of this topic, we've got Sleep More, Stress Less coming on October 4th. You can go to the wellness website and register for that. Or you can even go through your portal, the wellness portal, to register for the program too. So see more of that. You're welcome. You're welcome, everybody. So have a great rest of your day. And I hope you all sleep awesome tonight. And if not tonight, tomorrow. There's always another day. You can try it again. Be well. Take care. <laughs>